Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to calm Bob at all. Uh, in fact, I'm not only, as you can hear, very nasal, because I'm just recovering from flu, but I'm also very bewildered, uh, like a very befuddled old judge who had listened to a speech by a very, very learned and clever counsel and said to him at the end of it, well, I'm afraid I'm no wiser, Mr. Smith. And the council said, no, my lord, but a great deal better informed. And that's exactly how I am. I am better informed, but I'm no wiser. And uh, my confusion was really, over the last two days, lying in bed with flu, I was thinking about this conference. And what puzzled me was whether one could hold a conference about non-conceptual architecture. And I thought that really that would be very difficult because uh, it's really a non-starter, isn't it? Non-conceptual architecture. Because as people have kept on repeating, all architecture is conceptual in some way or other. There is a very unfashionable writer on art of the 20s who uh, tells the story of a little boy who had done a very clever drawing and somebody said to him, how did you do it? He said, well, it's quite simple. First I think and then I draw my think. Um, and that, those of us who design anything at all, uh, that is ultimately the description of what we do. Now, um, I was thinking of that in relation to a weekly necessity of mine, <coughs> which I have interchangeably with my wife, which is that of writing a note to the pil milkman, because he sometimes leaves us too much, much milk. And the note to the milkman is a simple chore, but when you are faced with it in a household where people type and write habitually, there are any number of pieces of paper of different sizes to choose from. And of course, most of them turn out to be DIN sizes, so you are limited, and you have to use a piece of paper which is one to root two. On this piece of paper, you can write in any number of colors because one of the things that consumer-oriented technology does provide us with are uh, barrows, felt-tip nibs, uh, fountain pens in a really wide range of colors. And you are then, you have your paper, you have you have a number of choices already. Uh, the whole thing is already becoming, isn't it, a formal problem. And then, of course, how do you write? The very way you form your letters, I know this will sound funny to some of you who have received handwritten notes from me, because I know I do write rather, rather indistinctly, but I do happen to be interested in the history of handwriting. And as you write down your note, the way you form your letters is, of course, conditioned by Platina, Arrigo, Taliente, the great masters of the Italian hand, by the fact that you've been through a school where you've been taught to write copper plate, which goes right against that tradition against which you rebelled and you went back to that Italic hand, and which is why I suppose my handwriting is indistinct. But all of these, in a way, lead you 
to taking a number of decisions, all of which are decisions about the way the thing is ultimately going to look. They are decisions which are conditioned by your particular historical situation, and they are conditioned also by the fact that the milkman does actually have to know what to do at the end of it. Now, this may seem to be a long way from designing a building, and yet when you go about it, the sequence of actions which you perform, uh, however much more complex than that of writing the note to the milkman, is ultimately analogous to it. And I would submit that uh, if you pretend that it is indifferent how you write to the milkman, that it is indifferent what color paper you use and what color of ink, that you are unaware of these things, then you are also ultimately uninterested in how you are going to design a building. That there is no, I hesitate to use the word, that there is no conceptual break between the two processes. That there is only an, an, an immeasurable gulf of complexity between them. Now, The reason why we are holding this conference, the reason why we talk about conceptual architecture, is in itself an interesting problem, which is related to what I've just said. You only have to go out of this door. This is a relatively acceptable room. But you only have to go out of this door and look round you, and you are surrounded by an aggressive and uh, confused and um, I'm looking for the word, it's not explosive, but it's, it's as it were, implosive environment, an environment which is actually calculated in order to stimulate internal conflict in you. Uh, we know, hmm? no, I, I think I prefer my implosive so far. Come up with something better, I'll, I'll have it. Um, the difficulty we experience in designing is that what we have to do is to insert into this environment something which inevitably must contradict it if we are to take our job seriously. Um, it must contradict and criticize it. Um, and because many of us feel unable to do so, or feel that any action must be that we will do in that we will commit ourselves to in criticizing it will be um, so violent as to be unacceptable. Uh, we tend to prefer to concentrate on projects which uh, are either unrealizable for economic or for social reasons. <coughs> now, this is not a new situation, and it's not by accident, of course, that Bernard Toomey this morning quoted Boulet, who took uh, that way out in a situation which he found uh, uncontrollable for rather different reasons. But he, of course, uh, in his, what he thought was his criticism of Vitruvius, made the same point as the little boy who drew his thing. There is no building 
which is not in some way preceded by a concept. Um, the point with which, at which uh, we talk about conceptualizing, about conceptual architecture, is a point in the history of Western art, which is um, very interesting, and in which there is a radical division between the way in which architects and painters operate. Um, the dominant trend amongst painters in this country, we are a little behind the times as always, but it is still uh, that which is called conceptual art, it's still very much in vogue, although of course it's phasing out, all fashions have their day. Uh, and this is the trend which reduces the physical experience of a work of art to uh, the most near uh, most nearly quantifiable formulation of uh, its configuration. Now, um, the reasons why uh, some painters have chosen this way were set out by John Sazakia this morning. You can judge them for yourselves. But as he himself seemed to suggest, it is, of course, a, a vicious circle, and um, at some point, a way out has to be found. Now, in architecture, the retreat from uh, <coughs> I don't want to use the term social reality, and again, social utility won't do, so I'm in a verbal clap stick again. Um, but Societal the hmm? Societal involvement. All right, that's a very good American <laughs> Societal involvement. The way out of that is um, um, to produce the uh, not a conceptual schema, not a set of Cartesian coordinates for a building but a building which is, in a sense, in defiance of economic uh, and social reality. Uh, that is the way as a, a number of younger architects have chosen. And it is analogous, but it brings out the essential difference between the protest of the architect against the environment and the protest of the painter, because the architect is essentially not a producer of buildings, but a producer of pieces of paper. I quote, some of you may know who I do, whom I quote, it's, un, it's unimportant, uh, the, it's not a, um, a written uh, source. I quote the ideas of Antoine Grumbach, who should have been here but isn't. So I say it for him. Uh, we are ultimately producers of papers, and the fact that those papers, that what is set down on paper is then translated into a volume, uh, into a three-dimensional volume, doesn't detract from the fact that our essential product is out of a paper. And that is true as much for the medieval master mason as it was for Michelangelo. And it is as true for the medieval master mason that the pieces of paper he produces may often not be translated into three-dimensional volume. <coughs> Look at the cathedrals at Strasbourg, or even at Cologne at Ulm, which weren't finished according to the medieval drawings until the 19th century. You all know the sad, tragic story of Michelangelo's scheme for St. Peter's. Uh, but it remains as a great and uh, seminal project which uh, 
we all know from those uh, multiplied engravings and from the wall paintings based upon them. Notice that time allocation has been 45 minutes, 30 minutes and 15 minutes according to age. Uh, I've got 15 minutes, so I'm going to go as fast as my age will allow me. Um, Bob, can I also assume that we're going to do a kind of joint summing up? Because rather than try and uh, present a paper in 15 minutes or, or whatever, I'm going to try and extract um, what has happened in the last day and today, and possibly also just express the frustration that's building up, been building up there the last hour, which. Uh, well, we'll sum up together. Okay? <laughs> and then the other thing is that exactly, I think some of the more interesting conversations yesterday and today, certainly for me, have been in the pizzeria over a rather crummy lunch with lots of wine. Um, and the people who have actually come together there have brought up some very important issues, which I hope um, they're all going to kind of join in and turn on all those who we feel should be turned on um, in relation to this idea. Um, the other thing that came up just before Joseph Brickwork got up again, uh, which was interesting because, again, it was an art historian, just like Rainer Bannon was pointing out, and we all agree that um, there has always been, there is always, and there will always be a concept art or an art concept and conceptual architecture and art con uh, architectural concept, um, and that we don't need to redefine these terms. What I do want to discuss, though, is that there is, especially in the art world, which gets back to my... Um, kind of protest yesterday afternoon, that I certainly think Peter took over the idea for this conference from the term conceptual art. He can, we'll have a battle about that afterwards, but I think that's where he first thought that maybe we should set up a, a, a situation where this other conversation could be discussed. And everybody has proceeded from there to take this glove called conceptual whatever and fit their fat fingers in one way or another, or thin fingers, and you know, try really to put that glove on. Um, while not actually considering that there has, especially in the art world, been a very specific conceptual aesthetic. There is actually a movement, a style, almost a school. It involves many different kinds of art, so I'm not saying that, I'm, I'm not doing an art historical job on it and saying that it all, you know, if you have A, B, and C, you have concept art. I'm saying that there is actually um, a history which can, uh, a contemporary history of the last five years, which describes a very specific kind of art. And I think that what was interesting between Let's take John Stesica putting up a pro-concept art and Bernard Chumi putting up a pro-concept architecture without actually having to define it but actually referring to specific work. Um, what's come out of that um, and taking, extracting those two pieces out of the rest of the conversation is that um, people have just been trying to find a way of, of putting work they've already seen into a concept art framework or conceptual framework. And I think that's really very, very clumsy because it's like suddenly saying, well, everything could be cubist. Let's call everything cubist from now on. Um, yes, there's always been cubist art. There's always been cubist architecture. That's the new word. Um, so that's, that's sort of plot number one, um, first three minutes or so. Um, oh, there are lots of other things that have come up you know, that I didn't want to discuss, which was the milkman's note, whether you call it, you know, that's the other thing. Suddenly we've got design forever or concepts forever. I think it's fairly relevant. I think what the Milkman's Note leads me back to is the notion that there actually is an aesthetic. And when people learn of the, the aesthetic involved in the, the Milkman's Note, then we will have a discussion about conceptual architecture, but not before, not if it simply gets uh, run down into a historical discussion which calls Benini conceptual. Um, so, back to kind of start of the other beginning, which is, um, you know, taking conceptual art, then conceptual art architecture, and the point I'm going to end up with is the idea of place, which is the gallery, in other words, the concept of the gallery, um, and the idea that, in fact, the only place where the concept gets realized, that it actually has visibility, is a, which is an American word, I believe, um, is in a gallery. It's not before that moment, and so what I'm going to end up with, which I said at the beginning, is um, the discussion that the concept does have a, a representational form, it does have a form, it is an object in the end, in its place in the gallery. And then the other part of the argument will be that in architecture, um, it, there isn't quite such an organized system as there is in the art world. Um, just some, to take up John Stesica's point two, um, he, I think he broke down very quickly for a lot of people, um, almost a definition, 
sorry, but you know, a sort of historical reference point to what made conceptual art or the idea of that, which was a the point about it being anti-gallery, about it being anti-critic, about it being um, anti-commodity. And the point I want to take up is the idea of it being an anti-commodity. Um, because I think this is one point that hasn't been discussed and it's something I feel very strongly about. So I would like to start with the point that by the mid-60s, the art market was enormously saturated with any kind of color field painting, abstract expressionism that you want to think of. And I want you to think of those paintings in terms of their financial value and not their art or aesthetic value. And also to remember that in 1929, the Museum of Modern Art was set up in New York by none other than Rockefeller and his family and was very much a vehicle for the early CIA movements, both in Europe, so during the Cold War, during the same period as McCarthyism, actually supporting the idea that you had radical art, and this radical art in, was part of the free world. It was marvelous, it was wonderful. And what was very unradical was the awful stuff that you found in Russia, which was called realism, superrealism, or whatever. Um, Alfred Barr, who was director of the museum, wrote a catalogue for the New American Painting. And these exhibitions were exported throughout Europe, again, to support this idea of American culture, and also to South America as a kind of fanfare to um, Rockefeller's mining interests. Um, and Alfred Barr was trying to say that, uh, I'll quote him because it's too good to miss out. Indeed, one often hears existential echoes in their words, meaning artists such as Pollock, uh, Gorky, etc. But their anxiety, their commitment, their dreadful freedom concern their work primarily. They defiantly reject the conventional values of the society which surround them, but they are not politically engagés, even though their paintings <clears throat> have been praised and condemned as symbolic demonstrations of freedom in a world in which freedom connotes a political attitude. In other words, th these artists work, and interestingly enough, they all left an earlier artist congress group, which was a very politically active group, to form the Federation of Modern Painters and Sculptors, who, to quote another art historian of the period, were more interested in aesthetic values than in political action. So Barr wrote in an article in 1952 in the New York Times, um, uh, the question was, is modern art communistic? In other words, he condemned social realism in Nazi Germany and said that totalitarianism and realism go together, but that abstract art in an American context shows this, what, the wonders you get from living in the free society. Um, so what we have in this case is that although, you know, the, again, there's only been very vague reference to it and everybody's been rather shy of, of uh, going into it because it's a very heavy discussion anyway and doesn't seem to ever get um, any completion, which is the idea you know, of the artist's role in any kind of political setup. So although I would say that abstract expressionists were not consciously involved in any kind of political action, and although they actually did forge something very new in terms of the artwork, um, they contributed, whether they liked it or not, to a purely political phenomenon, which was this need to divorce art and politics, which perfectly served America's needs in the Cold War. And so abstract expressionism was proclaimed by the Rockefeller family, by the Whitneys, by all these super um, power people as a symbol of political freedom. And uh, this is the point where I want to say that the artist's role by this stage, um, let's take it a bit later than that, thinking of the 60s, thinking of the political movements in Italy or in London, whether it was just at the LSE or not, or in Paris, where there was a political conscience, the whole anti-materialist move, the whole move back into the country or whatever, and that artists found themselves simply producing the commodity which would swell the auction market and had absolutely no control over their work. Now again, to take just very simply the obvious Marxist idea that the, 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 the worker is alienated from his work, um, there was no way that the artist could have any control over that work once it actually left his immediate presence. And so therefore, the, the only um, way the artist could withdraw from the system and so provide some kind of dissent while freeing himself or herself from being a commodity producer was to provide, refuse to provide these objects, in other words, to withhold labor. So the bourgeoisie, while in the process of withdrawing its commission from the artist, thus forced the artist into producing only for the investment market. 
And what was frightening was that the nature of this market, where the demand was to be discovered, had imposed a manner of production as well as a way of life. And, and that for me is a sort of fairly, I made my own crucial sentence, which was that, that the manner of production would change in an attempt to actually free the artist from this very limited role, which was the case in the 60s. So to jump very quickly from that um, to this insistence on the idea, because that was the only way that you could say, well, you know, you can't take my work and sell it. We're going to do things that are anti-galleries. Um, you're not going to get hold of it. They're not going to swell the market. You know, you're screwed. Don't know how we're going to live anyway, but we're going to do work that isn't solely for an investment market. So, obviously, the early intentions were quickly understood by the capitalist system and were altered to absorb that notion. And very quickly, of course, the circle completed itself. The written work would very easily be saleable. So the alternative anti-gallery anti art, such as land art, were massive excavations in middle American deserts, or a valley curtain which with, with, withstood the winds of the Colorado Plains for only some minutes before the red fabric was in shreds, or body art, where the artist insisted that it was the body of every person that was the artwork, their breath, shit, or various activities. Performance art, where the art was the experience of the group, and happenings led to this, a new art form which, interestingly enough, I, I sort of hop ahead, but comes to be called documentation. Um, this is fairly simple. The artist didn't go out into the desert to kind of loan a cowboy on a horse, but went very specifically in a private plane with one of New York's best photographers or whatever, took photographs of the event, and back to the city with the results. So, like lambs fattened in the field and taken to the city for slaughtering, all the remains of these activities out in some Indian reservation were taken back to the galleries and killed, carved, and distributed according to the immediate market. And so the market merry-go-round was on its way again. A slight jolt, but nothing to put the fair out of action for too long. Meanwhile, in Europe, the fairground had never been sponsored on the same scale as in the US. No enormous million dollar circle of stones in some Indian reservation. Rather, the, the uh, critical arena was kept much closer to the artist's everyday reality. If you think of Eve Klein or Manzoni, they both ridiculed the art market by throwing gold into the wind and getting some sucker to pay for it, or by producing cans of shit to be sold at the current price of gold and watching the market snap them up and ask for more, or by creating plinths, which they put in galleries and asked the audience to stand on and then call themselves the artwork, and what happened as a result of that was that you had three hour queues waiting in a Milan gallery to actually get up on the plinth and uh, proclaim themselves the artworks. So um, I'm doing quite well in terms of time. I wanted to go very far. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make in terms of a very specific conceptual aesthetic, um, what I'm trying to show, and I, I was going to show slides, but it seems to have detracted from the other talks today, so I'm not going to do that, is that on the one hand, a lot of different things came out of this move which was called conceptual. There was land art, there is body art, there is documentation, there is now narrative art. A multiple of different styles have come out of that very specific sensibility which made some kind of protest initially, which clearly got snapped up. The revolution died, but the fashion went on in some way or another, whether it was wearing blue <coughs> shirts or whatever. But the other type of aesthetic that I find interesting is somebody like Carl Andre, who, especially in quote, is very good and has referred to um, the notion of sculpture, which I'd just like to give an example here because, again, it's just useful as an illustration. Um, he describes the, the development of sculpture from kind of 18th century, where if you looked at the Statue of Liberty, you'd find that um, people in the 18th <coughs> century were more interested in the external form and the shape, you know, the kind of heroic form of such an enormous sculpture. In the 19th century, people were more interested in the structure, in the internal you know, all the kind of beautiful um, structure that was involved in actually keeping such enormous weight off the ground. And nowadays, he would uh, characterize the present-day sensibility as being that concerned with place. In other words, with Bedloe Island, where the, the statue is. And people tend to ignore the edifice or the, the interior structure of that edifice, but rather the place, its situation. In other words, a non-gallery, non-art, non-traditional art setting. So, um, that's, that's that. Um, the last point I wanted to get on to was, um, again, to refer you back to some of the work 
that um, Bernard just flashed through very quickly, but in fact relates to a lot of art uh, architecture that I've seen certainly at the AA or in, or in France in Italy that I would certainly consider to be part of this conceptual aesthetic. In some ways it very definitely borrows from the art world. Somebody like Ugo La Pietra I think is very clearly lifting um, an old aesthetic of documentation from the art scene and is, is simply transporting that to the architectural discussion, which is fine. Um, but I think the point that I've, I've stressed here, or I've tried to, which I, I'm not going to measure anymore, is, is that equation between people like Super Studio or the, the discussions of 68, where people were saying that the city, the buildings, etc., were a mirror representation of the society that created them. Um, that, that kind of political emphasis, all to make the equation of a similar implied critique in the art world, um, I don't feel it's too important to go on with here. But what I do want to go on with is the notion that the art world has a series of well-developed support organizations which allow these various concepts to be realized. And that even though these concepts appear to exist in isolation, whether Duchamp, to refer to back to Richard Hamilton, um, said that you know he was going to sign something and didn't. I think the important thing is what happens to most of those concepts and what I think John Stezica um, personated, or what's the word, something like that, but anyway, he was the embodiment of it, uh, was that they actually do work at presenting those ideas in galleries. And the, the clarity in John Stezica's work was because it is actually his artwork. It's very close to that artwork. He wasn't talking about other people's artwork. He wasn't trying to create an aesthetic that doesn't exist. He is the living embodiment of what we would call a school of conceptual architecture. Um, yeah, I think... It's, it's really this gap that I was trying to, that I was trying to clear, certainly in my own mind, and certainly putting the exhibition up at the college, where we're trying to link certain developments in art and architecture, between that level of, of uh, critique almost that has now existed in the art world, where they were trying to find a, a language, where they were trying to eradicate the middleman, to actually get rid of the critic and actually be responsible for their own definitions, um, and what's been very misused as a term that today and yesterday as conceptual architecture. Well, you're not talking about a specific aesthetic. All you're doing is suddenly saying, let's call everything conceptual and look back at, at various parts of history where we know that this has actually existed. Um, and then the final <coughs> kind of provocation was simply to say that taking the gallery um, as, a, as a thing in itself and as the place where the concepts are realized and taking the idea which um, I sort of Support totally is Bernard Chumi's idea that um, the architecture are the words or the figurations. Um, that architecture is without a gallery, it is without a system, it was, uh, is without a space where these concepts can be realized. And therefore, the logic of this argument forces me to conclude that unless some kind of system exists for that exposure, um, architecture also is very hard to find. Artwork done by these people, these workers, 
uh, is is a kind of rebellion against this very exact system, an exacting system. I touched on this in my introductory remarks. And uh, the equivalent of that in architecture is apparent. We had all the whole thing about the time and so on. But we haven't actually had any exposition during this time of how the uh, form of society which organized draws buildings through an equivalent system of deprivation. We haven't had that description. I, I have a question which is free and <coughs> very serious one, which is how does one use art which capitalists will not want to buy, in fact, which they will actually <coughs> refuse to buy? I find that a genuine problem. Mm -hmm. I find and it I, too. I, I will put you with a certain degree of a certain set of the Museum of Modern Art as capitalist plot. Not that much. Yeah, yeah. uh, obviously, it's eight years ago, and je m'en fiche de la fondation Rockefeller. And that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, I, yeah. The, the business is how to do it. Because ever since, you know, Ruskin versus Whistler. Yeah. Uh, and then the bourgeoisie said, we're not getting caught that way, being totally a long time and false now. And what the bourgeoisie began to say was, we're not going to be caught that way anymore. Yeah. Everything that comes out, we are going to buy now. And of course, that is the situation we described. But how can one put an end to that? There's clearly none. I mean, Manzoni couldn't shit enough to please the public. And, uh, you know, John Latham chewing art and culture now sits in Museum of Modern Art New York. There seems to be absolutely no way. Uh, maybe initially it has some kind of impact and actually changes the form of the art and brings up another kind of discussion which has... I mean, Gertrude Stein said you can't be a museum and be modern. You can either be modern or a museum and not both. That is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, there's a substance of residuals. Sure. I mean, how will you prevent the works of protest from becoming trophies of capitalist culture? I, for the life of me, don't know. Well, uh, you know, I think the English are very, very good at absorbing any kind of protest or dissent, whether it's an art form or any kind of political form, Hyde Park Corner or wherever. Um, you know, it's something you probably know a lot more about. Than you know, Colin, can, can I perhaps try to answer that? Uh, I guess that any protest has to be related to the context <coughs> this main thing. And uh, if you remember, for example, the graffiti which were on the wall of Paris in 68, the moment they were made, they had a very, very surface content. Uh, later on, on six months later, they were used as a prop for uh, car advertising, power to Peugeot, uh, or uh, for the other one. So in this respect, it's a very clear uh, reintegration, but I think that any, uh, let's say, uh, subversive content is definitely related to a set of circumstances. Yeah. Because subversive is being cheap. Uh, naturally, it's a set of commodities. And how in a capitalist society can a set of commodities not be set? No, no, uh, you know, there's a series of, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, type of protest, for example, violence, which is not set and uh, which may become so in another way, in a sort of secondary reinterpretation of violence to the movement and all that. But it's, it's reality, it is not. So there's a series of, of acts, and I think some of the artists, for example, through self-mutilation, as the whole Francis group, have been making that point at one moment. And that was a very powerful one. And this was, again, one we think about in the context. Well, I think it's a good idea. I just had to have our people in private at some time, and I'll have a chance to talk about it and say to the rest of the audience. Back in the 18th century, whenever it was we discovered the local south edge, uh, we looked for radical content, renewal, subversive interest, and all the rest of it in exotic cultures. Most of those have been conquered or destroyed by now by the operation of the whole of our industrial effort, and those that remain are rapidly on the way out. And we have rotated, to use an analogy I slapped for a public idiot who was in three months of his death, we've rotated the vectors of our esoteric interest by group minus one to 90 degrees. So now, it is absolutely demanded that the next generation in any culture that they perform a noble savage act. Now, this is very chic. What I'm trying to get at, and what I'm radically trying to get at, is to undercut everybody's political feet in this room. My point is that a lot 
of the people who are actually physically younger than I am, and nonetheless well cast already, whether they like it or not, for playing a part of subversion. And if you are cast for playing a role, then you're no longer a free <coughs> operational agent, and this bothers me very much. It bothers me very much indeed. Um, Dan, I think it was Dan Flavin who said that um, um, people are no longer buying works of art. They're, subsi they're subsidizing the artist's activity. Um, I I'd like to say that there is a kind of art which isn't being bought, and quite a lot of people are quite successful in producing it. And I point to it to substantiate this to a kind of art and a kind of art procedure that's scarcely been touched on in all the two days we've been here, even though I think it's the more interesting, indeed possibly the only valid kind of conceptual art that exists. Um, and that is the sort produced by John Stesica, um, who did obviously talk about it, but uh, the points that he produced weren't really picked up, I don't think. Um, and also the art language kind of work. Um, and in their case, what happened in New York was that they started to produce work which was written, and people insisted on seeing it as some kind of uh, book manifestation of the ready-made. And all the work that Rosalie is referred to has been sub du champion in this sense, and therefore rather uninteresting and rather boring. The work that Art Language produced and since, other people since, has been composed of something which is outside the scope of art but comments on art. <coughs> Um, and in that sense, one cannot buy it as art. It steps outside that framework. Mm. That's all. That's not true. You can buy it, and that's the problem with that. You, you, whether it's art or not is a problem, but you, when you buy a book or, or a magazine... No, I'm talking about the blow-ups that actually in the gallery or the gallery. Yeah, but you're not buying art. You're buying comments on art. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's the same discussion of Mandalorian when you buy a pen. No, it's not. Fundamentally not. This, this is why art language started off their entire career, by considering whether what they were producing was art, and what the, what the minimal conditions were for art, and how one individuates a work of art. And that's why the contextual discussion, which Joseph Pesuth raised, and went out into the desert to try and get away from, he tried to extend and experiment with this contextual problem. Uh, he didn't succeed too well. But art language, by starting a problem off and, and investigating the ramifications, at least forestalled the possibility of people thinking that they were buying art when they bought any publication or a blow up of anything that was produced by art language. Um, well, by the measuring, you know, how far the symbolic gesture and the measuring of gesture can extend, you know, from the previous in the past. I mean, I feel like back in, I'm not at all, but I do remember quite, you know, vividly the continuity of the situation of service in our countries and the revolution surrealist sort of scene still being something like a promise of future, you know, underneath trying to take the cope with the possibility and answers and inevitability maybe of the dilemma you're discussing here. But I think it's a very simple trick here. I, I'm not afraid to use the word. I would say that what it is is absolutely absolutely equivalent to maybe the uh, uh, basic points made during the two days here. And I would call it sort of a disease of continuism because you do nicely the trick to reduce all sort of sphere which in one stage Pop was talking about, you know, into a nice sort of little sort of nutshell and it's a symbol which represents the whole. You would like to believe that it does. Then you begin to play with it and try to solve all the possible problems in this little sort of nutshell holding a good hand. All the frustration, anxiety, and neuroses, of course, uh, you know, are being denied to again. And everybody's terribly surprised, you know, the table is going to close again and again, same point, with surprise and new frustrations and trying to make the whole another set of piece which might have the magic of answering the holes with a little bit, which is just a concept of the whole, nothing but. You know, call it symbolic life, call it magical gesture, call it withdrawal, call it you know, avoiding the danger of being turned new products or use of internet into a commodity, etc. All it is a series of magical gestures which hold one another. One is more interesting, one is less. But you are just playing the 19th century almost, not really century because in its origin it goes back to the 19th century of civilizing, you know, this little gesture is called art. Now I wonder how people long, how long they will enjoy this kind of, you know, 
vicious sort of sense for gain, going to be from one set of impact to another, repeating, not learning anything from history at this point. I mean, recent history, I'm not talking about, you know, past way, more than the latest 19th century, or latest 19th century. Still very much with us. We are in the 19th century. Okay. I want to start a question for Ben now, because we never had this kind of conversation before, but, you know, we came across, and obviously, somewhere, you know, in some previous discussion, uh, me on that point, and that probably might be agree. And in a nice way, very interesting, <coughs> it is agree, because that's probably where you would really yeah, and, and find well, something which is mutually interesting for yeah, both of us. I, I just, um, I probably answer very briefly, I think it was a very long conversation, which can be read in some uh, I mean, I'm a bit surprised at uh, your, you know, your assertion. Uh, you, know, you make an assertion about uh, the importance of uh, the understanding of history, with which I think most of us would agree, and uh, with by no means be blinded by the present situation. But now, uh, I think uh, some of our position uh, is basically considering that there is a series of very specific facts that we can isolate within the present situation, and which imply just as the tactic is being developed according to a series of facts that are around you, which imply that a certain position has to be taken. Now, this particular position may correspond to a sort of similar position in history, undoubtedly. But I think the set of circumstances changes slightly. And it began <coughs> with something that John Maxwell was trying to point out several times in the last two days. I think that notion that perhaps uh, using a, a term that I feel a bit sort of uncomfortable with, I use the term avant-garde, uh, that notion of something which is sort of slightly cut off from certain social reality, but allows to accelerate the process of change. Uh, if we take that particular concept, and if we accept it just uh, perhaps as uh, I would use the case of Jeanne in his cell, I mean, the avant-garde is in a cell, uh, not the institutional avant-garde of the school and all that, with, which we may be perhaps part, but the, the avant-garde which is in that cell, which actually uh, way has been put into by a series of forces which it has nothing to do with. And within that cell, it has to accept this, the reality of this cell and go into it and explore what are the possibilities within that cell. One day, the, the walls of the cell fall down and something happens, whether it is because the books get out and the books has an impact. But basically, there's a, a, a sort of qualitative change which happens by pushing the situation to the street. And I think what one is discussing is simply the fact that one is trying to take into consideration one particular situation right now and put it to this. So I'm not sure it's not an intellectual illusion. That's what I really point. You know, and that's one thing it worries me. I don't know how to do it, you know, to say something more, you know, to come again, you know, sort of bookish or going into anything which not looks like academic conversation. I don't know how to do it, you see, how to talk and not sort of uh, continue an academic discussion. What I'm simply worried about is, and I would like to have parents which will avoid the intellectualistics to have the sort of snobbishness, I would say, on one hand plus very close in hand going with the belief in the magic, magical sort of growth of whatever you call it, avant-garde, doesn't matter, of a group of people who are simply taking a stand which is almost by definition an exclusive stand, believing that through that enclosure suddenly something magical. I'm afraid that, you know, waiting for God of in a space. I'm not sure it is something I'm saying that there is no other thought. See, I would in that sense rather follow some of the points which Peter was making. I mean, Peter Cook, you know, was the rather cynical, maybe rather reserved uh, attitudes toward the kind of large intellectual gestures. And uh, taking, call it whatever you like, the pragmatic view, call it combination of the pragmatics, and, uh, and uh, you know, down to earth sort of business, whatever it means, design, etc. And, you know, I think this is something which, because it doesn't start with prejudices, these big assumptions, it's probably much more open to the possibility that something really might happen on the way which you don't expect. 
Well, I'm afraid, again, it's a disease of the con conceptual sort of attitude, where you try to see what <coughs> is likely to happen, and you would like to take a control of it. It means you really do believe that there is somewhere point in the future where the book will come out, or the revolution will come out, or something of that kind. But it is just nothing but an intellectual statement. Yeah, I, I cannot answer that. Can, I, can I just yeah. add something to what Bernard uh, Schumann said? Mm -hmm. really? Because, in a sense, he, uh, as it were, mirrors what Shani Rovelli said, he is waiting for the walls of the self to collapse, the great magical release. But ultimately, conceptual art, uh, the history of the last five years demonstrates it very clearly, as uh, we just heard is a series of uh, terrible disappointments which is based on the continuity of the myth of spectator art. And art is something which is put up and people look at. It is never something that you do. It is my book, I go down my legend to the third. It is really this basic difference between the attitude of the maker and the attitude of the, the maker who makes and who expects people to do likewise, and the maker who makes so that people may look at it and see what, as it were, he has encoded in it. I think there is a basic difference between these two attitudes that Danny was talking about, I suspect, and I think that the uh, illusion of conceptual art is that some sort of sense of illusion whereas it is part of the, the ongoing game of the art market, which is why one doesn't really want to accept the architecture in the same terms. This is why uh, I suspect it is bound to lead to another uh, uh, disappointment, another trial of whatever it will be, and then another disappointment. I think this is a, this is a game with no way out of it. The walls of the cell will not collapse. I mean, that's a word, an unfortunate uh, uh, metaphor, the wall of the cell, because uh, I define the wall of the cell one way, you know, one way, then another way, then another way. I mean, the wall of the cell are, of course, not conceptual art, not, of course, not you know, a series of art. Peter, Peter Reisman? Yeah. when they know goddamn well that they won't write a, a line for that magazine without the money which is paid for by the advertising. So what the hell difference does it make whether it's pornographic or censored? And what worries me is that by introducing this into the discussion, especially in terms of conceptual architecture, um, the worry for me is that when you bring political ideology into the content of art, Collins said it will always be consumable and commercial when you are addressing yourself to a critique of society. And why Cedric still will not allow me to answer the point, perhaps, why I said that perhaps architecture is a critique of architecture, which is only talking about the in internal essence of architecture, may be a non-consumable, non-marketable, and non-sellable commodity because it is not addressing itself to society and therefore ultimately be consumed by it. Um, can I just clarify that we've got the two parts there, which is um, the art itself is 
physical theory in general should be avoided. <laughs> There's somebody at the back there, yes? Um, I have a feeling that whoever is the best historian on conceptual art will find it is a far enough way. I don't think it's difficult to get artists and architects. This is, in a sense, what Peter is trying to do.